As always, I'm glad to be before you once more to deliver a lesson. Certainly thankful to be here this evening in spite of the, the weather, though we do need the rain. If you would, be turning to the first chapter of the epistle to the Colossians. This evening, I would like for us to discuss a few verses in that chapter. When you consider some of the epistles that the Apostle Paul wrote, there are four different prayers that he offers on behalf of the brethren. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15 through 19. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 19. Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. And our text tonight, Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 12. In the way of introduction, I, I would like to point out some, some things that I think we should keep in mind as we go through tonight's study. Is these four prayers were recorded while Paul was in prison. We'll see as we continue that Paul did not cease to pray for our brethren of the first century. Again, we'll see that these prayers emphasize the spiritual over the physical. And we see that he thanked God that the Colossians obeyed the gospel. Verses 3 through 8 of this, chap this first chapter. He ultimately prayed that these brethren would grow and bear fruit. Now obviously these, these different prayers were written in letter form to the churches of the first century. However, as we proceed through this lesson, no doubt these prayers apply to us as well today. So in going to our text, again, that's Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 12. Again, keeping in mind that these brethren have just become Christians. They've been baptized. They've been converted. And then we pick up in verse 9. There he writes, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom, and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which hath which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. So the first thing we'd like to consider this evening is the first aspect that Paul prayed for regarding our brethren in Colossae, which by extension, us today. And that is found in verse 9 of the, of the text we just read. Paul prays that the Colossians might grow in spiritual wisdom, that they might be ever grow, or filled with an ever-growing knowledge of God's will. This will of God has been preserved for all to understand. Not just some, not, not none, but all to understand. Colossians chapter 1 verse 28. We know from Romans chapter 10 verse 17 that reading God's will, being better familiar with it, is the only way for each and every one of us to grow faith. Thus, the Colossians were expected to be devoted to a greater study of that word, 2 Timothy chapter 2.15. Now, having this spiritual knowledge requires the proper attitude. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7 says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. This would include wisdom, which is knowledge that has been digested properly and comprehended. And this also consists of understanding, which is the ability to properly apply what has actually been learned. How are we going to use the things that we know? 
Paul prayed for these things. Paul thus prays that his brethren might understand the truths of Christianity, that they would be able to properly apply those truths to real life. We must realize that both of these are necessary. Doctrine must translate to real life. I'll give you an illustration. Consider Acts chapter 17, verse 11 and 12. There we have recorded about what was, what's called the noble Bereans. They had the proper attitude we see. It says, with all readiness of mind. You see, they were ready to receive God's word. They had the proper action, the proper activity. They searched the scriptures daily. They had accuracy. They searched the scriptures so that they could see whether or not these things were so keeping in mind that the apostles were teaching them. And they wanted to make sure that these men were teaching correctly, just as we should today. The Bereans had accomplishment. We see that many of them were therefore, or they, many of them believed. They were converted. They became Christians. You see, the right steps lead to a right result. Paul desires that we would have a deeper insight into God's will. That requires knowledge, spiritual wisdom, and understanding. He prayed this for the Colossian brethren, and no doubt applies to us today. Secondly, Paul prayed for their walk. We see this in verse 10 of Colossians chapter 1, the first phrase. There it says that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Walking in the Lord is one of Paul's favorite themes. We see this in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1. Philippians chapter 1 verse 27. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 12. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 1. He therefore prays that the Colossians would live as they know they should. You see, he's going from proper knowledge, spiritual knowledge and understanding, and we're building on it from there. So you've been taught correctly, and Paul's praying that they would increase that knowledge. And as you increase your knowledge, you're expected to put those things into practice. You're expected to walk. It's not enough to talk the talk, but you do have to walk the walk as well. But they were expected to do what they know was right. First John chapter one verse seven, Second Corinthians chapter five verse seven, and as well as Titus chapter two verse twelve. Now to walk properly requires the proper motivation, the proper motive mainly to being faithful. Romans chapter twelve verses one and two, how we are to be living sacrifices. What needs to motivate us in order to be that living sacrifice? You see, we should seek to please God just as the loving child seeks to please their parents. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. We know that God first loved us. It is only natural for us to want to love Him. Well, if you love me, keep my commandments. Simple as that. We should have motivation because God sent His Son to be sin on our behalf. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. And we should have motivation to serve God because He has offered every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. These things should cause us to want to know God's will and to put those things into practice so that we ourselves can actually be faithful to Him. Next, we see that walking correctly requires character. We must first be dedicated to God. Every thought, every word, and every deed must be used to glorify God. The Word of God must be our standard. It must be our guide. Psalm chapter 119, or Psalm 119, verse 105. Colossians 3, verse 17. 
His will must replace our own. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 and 16. James chapter 1, verse 22. Ultimately, our example is Christ. His whole life can be summed up with one verse. John chapter 8, verse 29. There, our Savior says, I do always those things that please Him, that being God. Everything He did, everything He said, everything He thought was the Father's will. And as our Savior, we are to emulate Him in all things. Paul thus prayed, that the Colossians would grow in their walk with God. Enoch had this relationship with God. Genesis chapter 5 verse 24. He walked with God through obedience to his will. The same is said of Paul. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 9. The Colossians were expected to grow in their walk with their father. Their heavenly father. We today are expected to do the same exact thing. Put the things into practice that we have learned from the scriptures and the things that we continue to learn. It's an ever-growing process. Third, Paul prayed for the Colossians' work to increase. The second portion of verse 10, Colossians chapter 1, he there says, Being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So the Colossians were expected to bear fruit immediately. This didn't take several years where we might think of, oh, a Christian has you know, a de developmental period and we don't, we don't really expect very much out of you. No, we were expected to work immediately. Now, we won't be able to perform the same things as, as older Christians, those who have been converted for much longer, but there's still work for us to do even as newborn babes in Christ. We must use the time that we've been given to properly serve God, to work for God. John chapter 9, verse 4. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. And Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. How are we using the time that we've been granted? We always say that we don't know when our end is going to be. But I don't think we really realize that our lives could end in the next few moments and we wouldn't know what's coming how are we using God's golden moments we sing that song you see the church has the most important mission on earth in human history and that is to seek and save the lost Luke chapter 19 verse 10 proper prayer proper prayer Proper planning and proper performing of our works ultimately glorifies God. John chapter 15 verse 8. It increases our spiritual knowledge. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 18. By putting those things into practice, by actively teaching others, we ourselves learn better the will of God. You take any subject, and you might know enough to teach others, but as you teach you start looking at it in a different light. And even though your students are learning from you and benefiting from the things you have to teach, the teacher always learns more from the things that they're teaching because they, they have to process it differently in order to make a proper lesson out of it. And fourth, we see that Paul prayed that the Colossians would wait, that they would wait. Verse 11. Strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Part of this waiting it requires the use of the wisdom, requires the use of the walking, and requires the use of the working as we've defined them tonight. This leads to spiritually waiting. Well, we consider the, the aspect of that of patience, which is the ability to withstand the different issues of life that we will face. Going through all of those different things with full confidence in God to see us through those adversities. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. 
I have a coworker that had pointed this concept out to me in a different way. And I, I saved this quote on my phone because I thought it was, it's a big motivator to me because this really sums up patience. It, it sums up how our attitude should be with all the different issues we'll face. And this coworker had some tough times when he was much younger, and now he's much better off, and he's learned a few things. So I, I like listening to him in, in secular matters. But his quote is, minor setback for a major comeback. You know, the book of James tells us that patience has our temptations ultimately grow our patience. The different things we face ultimately can make us better if we rise to the occasion. Then we consider the long-suffering aspect, which is the ability to be patient with people. You see, people are going to disappoint you. People are going to cause you pain. People will ultimately mistreat you. But having long-suffering with them will help you bear up under those different challenges especially knowing that they're outside of Christ and they need the saving gospel. Being long-suffering with people allows the Christian to see past those different actions of ignorance and to ultimately be able to teach them the gospel that they so desperately need. And then we see the, the joyfulness aspect, which is the ability to be content even through times of difficulty. Paul elsewhere says that we are to rejoice always. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. When people look at you and look at your day-to-day -day -day behavior, do they see a sad song? This should not be the case for the Christian. People should be able to look at us and know that something's different. They should see that joy. Now, that's not to say that we're always going to be happy. But we should always be content. We should be thankful for the different things that we've got. Ultimately, we should be thankful for our spiritual blessings that are only in Christ Jesus. You see, these different qualities allow the Christian to wait for our reward. We, song the song, we sang the song a moment ago about that beautiful home. John chapter 14 verse 2 points out that there are many mansions waiting for us if we're faithful to God. Throughout all of life's adversities, if we're faithful to God, we can see past these different things. And we can look to that in incorruptible inheritance as talked about in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 4 and Philippians chapter 3 verse 20. We can see past the physical and to the spiritual. We should be able to bear up all of life's burdens. We should be able to spiritually wait. This was part of Paul's prayer for the Colossians. And it is certainly applicable to us today. So we've, as we've considered Paul's prayer for the Colossians... We learn that even through adversity, we should still be concerned about our brethren. You see, in these different prayers that Paul penned, he didn't write, woe is me. His thoughts were on his brethren. Do we have the same attitude today? We should. We learned different things that we ought to pray for. Maybe not in a public assembly, but do you pray at home? Do you pray for your brethren? We all ought to. Especially in light of the way this country is going and more broadly how the world is turning. We know how current events are, recent days and other nations. That shouldn't frighten us, but we should be concerned about our brethren in other countries. What is this going to present them with? We must consider... And we must gain and increase our wisdom of God. The wisdom that is found only in His Word. 
We must realize that it is this wisdom that leads us to a better walk with God. And in walking, there is much work to be done. No one else is qualified to do that outside of the church. However, they might try. But all these different works that the denominations are trying, though they might be good works, they're still not qualified to be performing them. And as we work, this grows our patience. And this grows our longing to see our Lord. Are you prepared for His return? If you are, good. Continue that walk. Continue growing your knowledge and wisdom that only comes from God. If you're not, why not? Is, is something troubling you? Sin is the greatest guilt that mankind has ever known. And the only remedy is being obedient to the will of God. Ultimately, contacting the blood of Christ through baptism. Only then can you be washed free of your sins. If you need to obey the gospel this evening, please take the proper steps. We'll study with you. If you are indeed ready and you are accountable to God, make those steps. Become a Christian tonight. If you are, however, a Christian and you've not been living as such, take the next few moments to call on your brethren to repent of those sins, to confess them. And we'll pray with you and for you, and you will have those sins removed by contacting the blood of Christ once more. Whatever the need is, please make it known as together we stand and sing.